thing to work together. Okay, so, um, so how good, or rather how bad, is that two prime amino system? Uh, so we started to look at progressively longer uh, mixed sequence templates. And this is work mostly done by Jason Shrum and Alonzo Ricardo in the lab. Uh, so here are a bunch of Cs and Gs. We can start off with the primer, add the activated monomers, and get a little bit messier, but mostly full length uh, product in less than a day. So that's not too bad. Here we go to a longer sequence, now with all four monomers. And again, now it's a little slower. It takes maybe two or three days. We have some stalled sequences in here, uh, which we think are due to copying errors, a problem in the accuracy of the copying. And so, so solving that problem is going to be really critical. OK. Now, one of the more interesting things to come out of this model system was looking at a whole bunch of different uh, nucleic acids as templates. And what Jason did in this experiment is to use the same monomer building block in primer extension reactions where the template is either uh, DNA or RNA or a, a sort of confirmationally rigid variant of RNA called LNA for locked nucleic acid or two five-linked DNA. What you can see, these are little time courses. The DNA reaction is pretty slow, takes several hours. The RNA reaction is much faster. Uh, the LNA reaction is even faster yet, as done before the first 10 minute time point. So that told us that the more RNA like the confirmation and the more the template was pre organized, you know, made as a rigid, uh, in a rigid geometry that was ideal for the reaction, the better the reaction would go. So that result made us start thinking about uh, second generation systems where there'd be a little bit less conformational flexibility. And so these are the kinds of molecules we're thinking about. Uh, here's our sort of first generation two prime amino monomers. Uh, here are, are two molecules we're working on very hard right now. Uh, this one is based on uh, a threos sugar, a four carbon sugar. Uh, and so it's conformationally constrained in the sense that there's one less uh, rotatable bond per backbone repeat unit. Over here is a, a, a morpholino uh, nucleoside uh, where the sugar is replaced with this uh, six-membered morpholine ring. And uh, so this is conformationally constrained because of that six-membered ring. And it's also nice because this secondary amine is a really good nucleophile. OK, so the problem is, anytime you want to study one of these slightly different systems, you have to go into the lab and synthesize them. And so this has made my lab uh, into a real organic synthesis lab. And uh, so uh, hopefully there are a few chemists here who might like this part. but. Uh, uh, we've been working on different pathways for the last couple of years. Uh, we think we now have a really great way of making 2 prime amino 3 os nucleic acid. I should say this polymer was first made in the lab of Albert Eschenmoser uh, at uh, Scripps in California. And, uh, but we, we needed uh, a faster, faster, better, cheaper way of making it so that we could do these experiments. And what we do is we start from a really uh, cheap, uh, pure, easy to get starting material, uh, go through a few simple steps to make this glycal in pretty high yield. And then we do a really cool reaction, which is a heterodiels alder reaction to generate this bicyclic intermediate. And that goes uh, pretty cleanly. And the nice thing is, with these electron withdrawing uh, substituents here, this carbon is electrophilic enough that you can do direct nucleosidation. So you just add the nucleobase you want, uh, you displace this oxygen, and you get uh, this key intermediate here. And all you need to do then is to clean this up by deprotecting it and reducing the hydrazide uh, to the amine, and you have uh, the structure you want. So we're very uh, pleased with this synthetic route. We think it's going to let us uh, start getting some interesting data on the TNA system uh, very soon. 
The other one, the morpholine uh, system, is very nice because it's synthetically extremely easy. You can just start with normal ribonucleotides, and in a one-pot reaction, uh, oxidizing this and then doing a reductive amination, you get the morpholine ring structure in very high yield, and then just uh, put on a, a photolabile protecting group uh, on the secondary amine. Then you can phosphorylate and activate, remove this group. So in a few simple steps, you have the activated uh, morpholinonucleosides. And uh, so this work was done by Alonzo Ricardo uh, and an undergraduate, uh, Sam Bjork. And we've just started to get the first uh, experimental results uh, using these uh, conformationally constrained morpholinonucleosides. And it looks like they polymerize very efficiently on RNA templates. So we're very excited about that. It's very preliminary results. Uh, we're going to be able to make uh, uh, templates based on this polymer, I think, within the next uh, few days or weeks. And so we're pretty excited about you know, whether this is actually going to lead to a real replication system for the first time. OK. Let me just finish up then by telling you one last little story. And that is, assuming, just imagine now, for the sake of argument, that we can get a real replicating genetic system. What would, what would it be good for? What would you actually expect to evolve from such a system? And so we've been thinking about that for a while now. And uh, so one question that came up was how you would make the transition from the primitive kinds of membranes that I talked about earlier based on fatty acids, uh, which are very dynamic and very permeable, um, very ideal for a simple system that has no evolved machinery. We know that there had to be some transition to more modern membranes, which are based largely on phospholipids, along with lots of other more complicated lipids. But these are much more static structures. They're very good barriers. They're, any cell that uses those kinds of membranes has to have already evolved a lot of machinery to help get things across the membrane. So what, what would be a plausible intermediate state? So a logical thing to think about is a fatty acid membrane, I think, with a little bit of phospholipid. Phospholipids are easy to make in just one simple synthetic step from uh, fatty acids and lysophospholipids. But the question is, you know, what possible selective advantage would there be from such an intermediate state? Right? If you just have a little bit of phospholipid being made in an early protocell, it's not going to take over the population unless there's a selective advantage. Okay. So um, enter a new brilliant graduate student, Itai Buden, in this case, uh, who started thinking about this. We were talking about it. We realized we'd actually done some experiments years ago that suggested that mixed membranes like this might behave a little bit differently in that the phospholipids seem to essentially have a high affinity. They really like to be surrounded by fatty acids. They tend to keep the fatty acids in the membrane. So we thought, well, if they come out more slowly, but they go in just as fast, maybe they could grow by taking advantage, by basically stealing molecules from pure fatty acid membranes. So we went into the lab, did the experiment. He made a population of mixed membranes. They're perfectly stable by themselves. Fatty acid vesicles, perfectly stable by themselves. As soon as you mix them together, the mixed ones start to grow, essentially by eating the pure fatty acid vesicles, which shrink. And this is what it looks like. Here's a, a parental uh, mixed vesicle. Uh, he mixes them with excess pure fatty acid vesicles, and over uh, a few minutes, they grow, again, in this filamentous form. So they gradually transform into long filamentous structures. And those, again, you can make them divide just by gentle shaking. Okay. So all that it would take to get something like this started would be some ribozyme or ribozyme-like you know, nucleic acid that could catalyze that single acyl transfer reaction 